Welcome to this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade Podcast, where we look forward to shaving every day. Welcome to this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade Podcast. My name is Rick DeWeese. I'll be your host this week. Um, This week, we've got a couple of emails, three actually, (laughs) gimmicks galore. Uh, Yeah, we'll talk about that. A Friday shave of the day. Uh, Don't forget the blades. There's something special going on this weekend with the Boy Scouts. Jamboree on the air. Seven mistakes a new shaver could make. A Monday shave of the day. I'm going to be off for training for a while. May or may not impact the podcast. Don't know yet. Another Wednesday shave of the day, and finally I'll finish up with a talk about rhetoric and the beauty of rhetoric and why when someone says the word rhetoric, it's not a bad thing. Anyhow, that's the show this week. Let's get on with it. So I happen to be sitting around enjoying the evening, talking to my wife about the goings-on of the day and you know, just generally relaxing. We're watching a show on TV and just, you know, just generally putzing around and, you know, doing whatever. And at one point I look at her and I go, hmm, it's 8.30. And she looks at me and says, so? I look at her and I say, I'm supposed to be doing a podcast. And she said, well, you better get up there. Well, there you go. So uh, the life of a podcaster, especially when you're not paying attention to the goings-on of, uh, of, well, the podcast. (laughs) So let's start off with an email from Paul. Hi, Rick. Hope this email finds you and your family going well. Like all of your other emails and correspondence, I, too, would like to thank you for the podcast and the effort you put into it. Your logical and down-to-earth thinking is a breath of fresh air in this nanny state world we now live in. Recently, listening to episode 99 was like hearing the voice in my head. Spot on, Rick. Spot on. Here in Washington State, we have an insanely high fuel tax. Why? Because we are driving more efficient autos and the state is not getting enough tax revenue. For years, they pushed us to drive more fuel-efficient vehicles. Give me a break. Also, if you go into a tobacco shop here, it's against the law to have a pipe or cigar there. Really? Are we not adults? Whew. This country has a long road to hoe. Okay, rant over. I've been a wet shaver since 2007, have tried many soaps and creams, safety razors, and straights. What a great way to celebrate and demonstrate what being a man should be. Taught my son also. Looking forward to listening to more of the podcast. Been listening since episode one. Best regards, Paul. He's also a former Boy Scout as well and an amateur radio operator. What a deal. Anyhow, yeah, Paul, you're absolutely right. Um, <laughs> We do live in a nanny state, don't we? Uh, They tell you to conserve water, but then when they don't sell enough, they charge more. They tell you to conserve, uh, you know, electricity, but every time, even when you use less, they want to charge more. Um, They tell you to use less gasoline, but then when you get more fuel-efficient cars and drive less, well, they still want more. In the end of the, the, the whole thing, the underlying symptom is that, well, they just want more. They want more of everything. Have you ever noticed that government, government, never goes with a pay cut? Ever. You know, I've been in, I've been in the, in the uh, business world for a, a long time. We've had ups, we've had downs. We've had times when we have tightened our belt. There haven't been any raises, there haven't been any investments. You know, those are the type of things that happen commonly and typically with business. Because the money ebbs and flows just in a natural way of, you know, the economy. Have you ever noticed that that never happens with government? Ever. And it doesn't matter if it's national government, state government, local government. It's almost like once government exists, it becomes instantaneously addicted to our money. And... (laughs) Maybe the reason that it's addicted to our money is because at the same time that it's wanting more and more, it's also eroding the value of the dollar by printing so much of it. And therefore, just to have the same buying power, they need more and more of the stuff that they're supposedly giving us. Well, actually, they're not giving us anything. We're earning it. But anyhow, I digress. Anyhow, uh, rant over. (laughs) 
Yeah, I also think it's funny that uh, you know if you go into a tobacco shop, you can't have a have a pipe or a cigar. Uh, really, in a tobacco shop? I, come on. <laughs> Oh goodness. It, it is it is interesting. We have I don't know, we've kind of lost common sense. I was listening to another podcast and there was a guy talking about a lady. I think she was in New York. And she was arrested and fined because she was trying to get a piece of fruit off of a tree in a park. <laughs> So, you know, they tell us to be conservative, you know, conservation minded and everything and and somebody plants a uh, a fruit tree, but then <laughs> don't eat the fruit off of that tree because well, that's defacing public property. Really? What else are you supposed to do with it? I mean, come on. Somebody can't benefit from something? It, it's it's really maddening. We've we've lost common sense. And you know, like he said, and I agree with him, the, the police officers, if that's what they were, who came and fined this lady for trying to get a piece of fruit off of a fruit tree, they ought to be smacked. <laughs> I mean, really, where's the harm? Uh, you know, it's not like she's out robbing somebody. It's not like she's got criminal intent. She's trying to get a piece of food off a tree. Uh, it's amazing. Anyhow, <laughs> okay, yeah, there's a lot of things that I can go on and on about. Anyhow, Paul, thank you very much for the email. Um, yeah, I hope to do more podcasts. I enjoy doing them. Um, you guys think I put a lot of effort into them? Eh, maybe. I don't know. I don't see it as effort. It's uh, it's just one of those things, you know. It's It's what I do on Wednesday nights. It keeps me off the streets. Anyhow, thanks again for the letter. I got an email from Mark, a new find. I was in a waiting room, and I spotted someone on the Badger and Blade website. He began talking about wet shaving. I told him about my YouTube channel, and he told me about his collection. He had purchased several upper-end razors, including the pills above the tie and the feather, all stainless steel. So I had to ask him what his favorite razor was. He said the Parker 94R. To be honest, I didn't own a Parker, and I didn't know which one he was talking about. I quickly did a search on YouTube. I couldn't find a shave of the day with one in it. I went to some of the forums and heard some good things about it, so I ordered it. This is a heavy, short-handled razor that is somewhat aggressive, but is balanced and gives a remarkable shave. It's under $30 and is simply an incredible product. Anyone looking for something new, give it a look. Cheap Salsa Bowl regards, Mark. Well, Mark, as always, thank you very much for the email. Um, Good tip. I don't own a Parker either. I may have to think about getting one one of these days. But uh, isn't that the nice thing about the community is that we can share this kind of stuff and pass around knowledge and information? So good stuff. Also, thank you for taking the time and trouble to do a YouTube channel. Um, I know what it is like trying to keep one up. And, uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you for the email. So I also got an email from Sean. Now, Sean happens to be, well, a tad unique. He happens to be in the Navy, and he also happens to be on the USS John C. Stennis. Um, he is an, uh, an interior communications electrician. He's also a chief, and uh, so he wrote me uh, questions. So uh, first off, I heard on one of your podcasts that you were in the Navy. How many years were you in, and what was your rate? Okay, I was in the Navy from 1980 to 1987. I was a uh, a machinist mate, and I happened to be a nuclear machinist mate. Uh, I started off, uh, this was back in the day, holy cow, this was, uh, the, the first ship that I was on was the USS Preserver, which was a salvage ship. Now, back in the day, and they stopped that afterwards, probably because of people like me, but back in the day for machinist mates, they would send us to A school, for a machinist mate school, and then they would send us out to the fleet for about six months. And what ended up happening is they would try to get all of the, all the electricians and uh, and uh, reactor techs and you know the RTs and, and all those guys 
from the same classes and, and the same time period when we enlisted, and they'd all try to line them up so that they came back together in nuke school. And so because our school was shorter, they sent us to the fleet for like six months. So, you know, we were there, and for us, as soon as we got out of uh, out of A school and uh, were machinist mates, they slapped third class uh, ranks on us and said, okay, there you go. Well, going out into the conventional Navy like that, you have no idea what a third class is or what they're supposed to do or how long most of them had been around in the regular rates. So here you are straight out of school. You know, it's almost like being a, a young JG or something. <laughs> you got no clue what's going on. It's like, ah, first class, help me. <laughs> you don't even want to talk to the chief. Chief will just knock you upside the head and go, get out of here. <laughs> Anyhow, so that was my first ship was USS Preserver. Then I went to nuke school, and then uh, then I went to my uh, what I call my real boat, um, which was the USS Texas, CGN-39. It was a nuclear cruiser, and uh, when I got to her, she was the only nuclear cruiser that wasn't assigned to a carrier group. And so we got to do all kinds of neat things in the uh, short duration that she was uh, underway and I was on her. Uh, one of the things that we got to do is go mess with the Russians. And, uh, you know, that was a long time ago. That was back when you could do those things. So, uh, well, that's what we did. And then after we did that, we went into the yard. So uh, so I went from San Diego to uh, to Seattle, Washington, or actually Bremerton, Washington, for, uh, for overhaul. And uh, I went by way of uh, Vladivostok Peninsula in Russia. <laughs> Now, before I got to my uh, my ship, I also uh, there was a stint there where right after nuke school, uh, I went up to prototype, and I was I went to the A one W prototype, which was uh, up in Idaho, and uh, and so I stayed up there, but I also got picked up for staff. So quite honestly, I was up there at prototype for uh, well, almost five years. So when you look at my Navy career, it's probably a whole lot different than most. I loved my Navy career because out of seven years in the Navy, I spent two years and two months on a boat. And out of that two years and two months, I spent two months out at sea. <laughs> I know you're jealous. It's okay. <laughs> I understand. Anyhow, that's what I was. And I was a machinist mate. I was a snipe. I was down in the bilges and in the engine room, and I loved everything. Every single minute of it. And um, if I had to do it all over again, yeah, I'd do it all over again. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Made a lot of good friends and, uh, more importantly, a lot of good memories and, well, grew up a lot, too. So, all in all, good stuff. Anyhow, the email continues. I originally tossed my Gillette multi-blade razors for disposable twin blade razors that were cheaper, but the shave was horrible. A few months ago, I bought an as-seen-on-TV razor from a local store and began enjoying shaving once again. I quickly upgraded to an Edwin Jagger. I quickly upgraded to an Edwin Jagger and Mercure 37C HD slant. Based on your review of that razor, I'm a chief in the Navy, and I even shave with a safety razor, brush, and soap on the ship. At first, I used to hate shaving with cold water, but you work with what you've got. Well, absolutely. Um, <laughs> in fact, it's interesting. Uh, on submarines, they can't use aerosol cans, so uh, they don't have the opportunity to use goo in a can. So uh, all of them are probably either not shaving or enjoying, uh, you know, shaving with decent soap, hopefully. <laughs> But a surface ship is different, you know. After uh, after Chow, you can actually go out and uh, and see the stars and you know breathe fresh air. Open a door. <laughs> yeah, I was a I was a, a well as the submariners call it. I was a target, and uh, I enjoyed it because uh, I used to go out and tan in the uh, mid afternoon. They didn't get to. Ha ha. <laughs> All right, so. The email continues. Uh, what is your take on the shave secret oil that is supposed to replace shaving soap? I use it with my soap and find that I cut myself less with less skin ir irritation and generally get a much better shave. Okay. 
Um, I have never used Shave Secret uh, at all. I never never picked up any of it. I have at one time tried an oil as a pre-shave. And while it was nice, it improved the glide, I didn't find it, well, that much different. And in fact, if I want to improve the glide and, and performance of my soaps, um, if I feel that strongly about it, I'll add a couple of drops of glycerin because it has about the same effect. Now, I don't know how much uh, Shave Secret costs, and I didn't bother to, to look it up, but uh, a, a thing of glycerin for a fairly, you know, significant bottle, probably, I don't know, four, three to four ounces or so, um, cost about six bucks the last time I bought it, and it, you know, one, two, three drops uh, every shave, it'll last a long time. So, uh, I don't know. For me, there's a bit of hype with the with any shave oil. I that I, for me, I've never bought into it. Um, just never have. Although in the uh, on the ship, you know, it would probably lubricate the gears and and blades down in the uh, in the uh, chipper unit that you have for the <clears throat> sewage. <laughs> But uh, soap will do that too, by the way. Um, <laughs> anyhow, uh, so like I said, to me it's always been just a bit of hype, and I've never really bought into it. So that's that's my my general feel, my my thoughts on it. I prefer glycerin, but uh, actually I prefer soaps that are nice soaps, you know, tallow based or something like that that I don't really have any irritation with and don't have any problems with. Okay. Also, he asks. Um, what about alum shaving stones or sticks? I love them, but find I have to use a facial moisturizer afterwards or my skin gets dry and slightly itchy. Yes, that will happen, especially if you start off with uh, fairly dry skin. Now, I have just the opposite problem. My skin has always been uh, fairly oily, so I don't get itchy, but it does dry you out very badly. Now, Personally, the alum block that I have is uh, is a French alum block that I got over at West Coast Shaving, and I can't remember the brand. It's over in the bathroom right now, but uh, it's a great thing. I mean, you know, when when I have a little bit of irritation or something like that, just putting that on really really helps. Um, it's a uh, Osman, yeah, Osman, I guess it is. But uh, yeah, that's a that's a great stick. So I really really like the uh, the alum blocks. Now the other thing that you got to watch out for is there's alum and then there's the styptic pencils and they're made out of different stuff, and the alum is a lot gentler. Um, it's a lot less uh, stingy, if you will, and uh, so I do enjoy the alum. And in a pinch, okay, in a pinch, the alum can actually act as a deodorant. Um, just, you know, for those that travel and, uh, well, those in the Navy service or whatever, um, you know, if you run out of deodorant or something, you do have, if you've got a loom, you do have an option, okay? Anyhow, so there's my thoughts on that. <laughs> Great email. <laughs> he says, I used to hate shaving, but have found the ritual relaxing and enjoyable. You talk about a lot of razors, but what is your favorite one? If you could use... Only use one for the rest of your life. What would it be? Keep up the great work and thanks for the great podcast. Okay. Um that oh gosh, that is a tough question. Okay. So All right, my first really really favorite razor was probably my Gillette Aristocrat. That was the first one that I got my hands on that really did just an absolutely magnificent job. It was smooth. It was gentle. It was it was perfection. It really was. Now the next one that I got that was in that same league, but also offered something a little bit more, was my first Fat Boy. So the Fat Boy has a little bit bigger head than the than the Aristocrat, but it still it just it was comfortable. You could adjust it. So if you had some blade variations, you could do that. It had some heft to it. It's just a nice razor. So eh, it's kind of a toss-up between those. But then I also have uh, an adjustable that happens to be my birth year razor that is not only birth year but birth quarter. Uh, so that's got the sentimental thing going on. 
And then I've got the single edge razors, and you know I've got a uh, a valet auto strop that when I put the uh, you know the feather blades without the spine in it, it's just oh it is awesome. It is it is really a fantastic razor. So there's that, and then I got you know. I've got my Damascene, my Gem Damascene, which is a wonderful razor. And in fact, I've asked many times why no one makes single-edged razors of that style anymore. They make single-edged, but they're like injectors or something like that. And the Damascene is just a wonderful, wonderful razor. It does a beautiful job, and I really, really like it. Okay, so back to the question. If I could only have one, hmm. I would have to go for the sentimental value just because and go with the adjustable slim uh, birth year razor. Although, no, nah, that's what I'd do. That's what I'd do. But I would cry every single time I picked it up. Not because I had to use it, but because I, well, I didn't have a choice. <laughs> Anyhow... <laughs> So he finishes up the email, sincerely, ICC, SWAW, Sean Jones, USS, John C. Stennis, CVN 74, Visual Landing Aids, LCPO. Well, Chief, first off, thanks for being there. Um, quite honestly, and I mean this with absolutely all sincerity, thanks for stepping up when I stepped out. You know, um... Uh, Whenever I w was in, I always, you know, imagined, and we, we, we thought about this. And, in fact, me and my shipmates talked about this uh, from time to time. What would have happened if we hadn't joined? What, wouldn't, what, what would have happened is if, if when we get out, nobody joins to fill our shoes? What would it be then? So we did think about that. And so, like I said, I do mean that in all sincerity. Thank you. Thank you very much for being there. Uh, makes me proud. Um, I'm glad you wrote in and uh, reminded me of a lot of absolutely excellent times that I had in the service. Go Navy. So here's a story that I ran across. Introducing the Seven Blade Razor. No, seriously. This is a news story on Nasdaq.com by, by Paul Zylbro. So he, he writes, Not even the satirists at The Onion predicted the Razor's latest iteration, Seven Blades. The U.S. arm of the Korean razor maker Dorco Company is launching the Pace 7, which packs seven blades into the head of its razor cartridge. The new model tops Dorco's own six-bladed razor and has two more blades than the dominant U.S. brands Procter & Gamble, Gillette, and Edgewell's Personal Care Chic. The race to cram more blades into a quarter inch of real estate has been a punchline of comedy writers. In 2004, the satirical newspaper The Onion ran a fake op-ed purportedly from Gillette's then-chief executive Jim Kiltz, boasting plans to top a rival's four-blade razors by going with five. Two years later, Gillette came out with the five-bladed fusion, now the top-selling razor in the U.S. by market share. The joke underscores a real challenge for the U.S. shaving industry, which racks up nearly $3 billion. I repeat, $3 billion with a B of annual sales of everything from creams and aftershaves to razors and blades. Consumers no longer equate more blades with a better shave, especially when each edition comes with a higher price tag. Ken Hill, chief executive of Dorco USA and a former Schick executive, acknowledges that there is skepticism to overcome. Our R&D group really believes that the seven blade is a much better shave than the six blade, Mr. Hill said. 
Gillette and Chick have turned to other features in the face of blade fatigue. Gillette introduced a new razor, the Pro ProGlide Flex Ball in 2014 that swivels side to side with the aim of maintaining better contact with the face to cut scruff shorter. Schick, meanwhile, has been promoting its Hydro 5 that moisturizes skin during shaving with a gel reservoir. Wow, I can't read any more of this garbage. <laughs> Golly. Okay, so we got the, the Dyson sphere of shavers that, you know, God, don't even get me started. We've got something that has a reservoir with goo that spits out at you while you shave. And now we got seven blades. Oh my gosh. Uh, really? <laughs> and God knows what they're charging for this crap. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, I think about it. I've got, I've got single edge razors in there that can do, and, and okay, so <sighs> I have single edge razors in there that can do with one edge what they're trying to do with seven. I have double-edged razors that have two edges, one on each side. A little bit more balanced, maybe, a little bit more convenient, don't have to rinse it as often. They can do the job that they're trying to do with seven. I dare say that for the better face contact, if you took a little bit of time and prepped correctly and used the correct soap and brush and, well, technique that you wouldn't have to have a swiveling head unit. You wouldn't have to have one that looks like a Dyson vacuum cleaner. And you surely would not have to use, if you are using proper shaving lather with a brush and applying it between strokes or passes, as we call it, you wouldn't have to have a razor that spits goo out of a reservoir. Just saying. <laughs> but again, like I've said many times, keep in mind, this is a $3 billion industry, as purported in this uh, article. And it's an industry that they know is going on the downhill slide, and they're trying to scrape every last penny out of it. And the only way that they can do that is if they have something that is patentable. Now, Gillette already has the five and six in a five blade. Dorco has a six blade. I imagine that Dorco came out with the seven blade because Gillette or Schick was really right behind them and they beat them to the punch. That's what I suspect. <laughs> Otherwise, why do it? Anyhow, interesting article. I will link to it. But really? Seven? All righty. Well, it has been a busy uh, couple of days here, a busy morning. <laughs> it's just been busy. Holy cow. Trying to do about a thousand things all at the same time. Uh, well, it, it just gets to be a little much at times, but that's okay. We have uh, survived and uh, struggled through the uh, the events, and uh, let's talk about the shave of the day. Okay, so the shave of the day today... I used a soap that I haven't used in, well, a while. And in particular, that was Taylor of Old Bond Street, Eaton College. Now, one thing that I've noticed about my uh, my container of Eaton College is that when I pop the lid off said container, it is only about half full. And quite honestly, I really, really like that because what it allows me to do is load my brush without soap going, you know, everywhere. Uh, one of the problems that I have, it's not really a problem. One of the things that I've noticed, let's put it that way, is that if you have a container that is, you know, full of soap, as you load it up, the soap, you know, comes out all sides and down the bottom. And, you know, I hold my soap kind of sideways over my uh, lather bowl and then uh, load the brush that way. And, probably half the time I'm concentrating not necessarily on 
you know, loading up the brush, but on making sure that the little balls of soap that uh, that are generated by that event actually fall into the lather bowl instead of all over the sink making a mess. It's just one of those things. Now, the nice thing is, is that with a container that is only, well, half full, uh, you don't have that issue. So, soap makers, if you uh, happen to have the opportunity, uh, it would be, uh, at least in my mind, a, a good thing to do to put uh, the same amount of soap in a container that is uh, twice as large. It's just, uh, it would make it nice. It would make it easier to load and easier to contain. And uh, for face lathers especially, because you could just kind of load the brush up and then uh, go straight to the face and, uh, you know, it just wouldn't be quite so messy. Yeah, you'd have to have more room in your cabinet for uh, for soap containers, but I think overall it'd be a good thing. Anyhow, back to the shave of the day. So today's shave of the day, I tried something different. Normally what I'll do is I'll do one to three passes with a double-edged or single-edged, and then I'll touch up with a straight. Today I only did a single pass with a single-edged and then did the rest with a straight. Um, so it was really only a, a two-pass plus some uh, touch-up, and I wanted to see just the efficacy, if you will, of the uh, of the straight razor in uh, in the second pass. And it didn't do too bad. It uh, it really didn't on the flat surfaces, especially. And what I what I see here is is and what I'm experiencing is that on the flat surfaces, it's really really an efficient way to shave, as far as time goes. Um, you know, I could probably get a little bit closer, a little bit more comfortable. You know, with with a little bit less uh, aggressive behavior and uh, you know maybe a three-pass shave or whatever, but uh, for a two-pass shave, what I end up with is something that is relatively quick and uh, very, very smooth um, on the flat surfaces. Now, of course, down in the neck area where I always have issues anyhow, um, I really need the ability, quite honestly, to uh, to uh, get in there with a either, you know, an exceedingly small straight razor, uh, which I don't have, and uh, by that, I mean one that's, you know, about the size of a, well, single-edged blade. <laughs> so because of that, a single-edged uh, razor or a double-edged, you know, a, a, a safety razor uh, works exceedingly well for me. <laughs> it's just one of those things. Um, but uh, but on the flat surfaces, yeah, that's, uh, that's the way to go. So uh, anybody that tells you you have to take extra time for a straight razor shave, eh, Maybe, especially when you're starting out, but uh, later on, eh, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's up for debate, I think. So the uh, the shave of the day went went very, very nicely and uh, finished up. I You know, the other day I was talking about the tribute aftershave, and uh, so I threw some on ah, because it just kind of goes with the Eaton College in my head and uh, seems to uh, go well with the Eaton College on my face as well. And uh, so we'll see how it uh, how it lasts. But it is a very mild scent. It's not like some of the other scents that I have. Um, it's uh, it's it's just I don't know. It's mild, but uh, I enjoy it. So there you go, shave of the day, and uh, we'll get on to uh, going about dealing with the events of the day because well, there uh, uh, there's a lot of them today, and uh, well, it's going to be a busy day as well. Busy weekend, busy day. It's just, uh, it's been busy. I'll tell you what. It's uh, it's amazing when I think about it. At the end of the day, you kind of go, ah, wow, I made it through. And uh, you kind of reflect back, just just take a moment and, uh, and realize that, uh, yeah, you got a lot, you know, you've done a lot. Don't know that I've gotten a lot accomplished, but I've done a lot. And there is a difference in those two things. And, uh, well... There you go. But this morning, anyhow, we're uh, we're going into the world, uh, you know, clean shaven and uh, well, ready to take it on. Well, I need to relate a story. <laughs> so my older son came home from uh, from college and uh, just for a day or two, and uh, we were sitting around talking and. 
He happened to look over to me at one point and say, uh, Dad, just out of curiosity, you got any extra blades? I'm like, uh, blades for what? He said, my razor. I said, ah, okay, yeah. So uh, I got to admit, it was not something that I had thought about. It was not something that I had uh, pondered. But uh, when I had originally given him the razor, uh, his, his, him and his brother both, um, I gave him, I think, one pack of blades, one pack of ten blades. And that has lasted a good long time. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it makes sense that he would ask for them. But I also find it good that he, uh, he understands that uh, he's supposed to change the blade out from time to time. And uh, so, good stuff. But uh, it was interesting. It was a perspective that I hadn't really thought about. Maybe that'll be a good Christmas present or something. A supply of blades. Eh, we'll see. But uh, it was good. And, of course, the other thing that's just kind of neat is uh, when I go past the bathroom that my younger son uses, well, there's Gillette Super Speed sitting on the counter. And, uh, yeah, good stuff. Well, this coming weekend is a rather special weekend because... It's time for Jamboree on the air. Anyhow, we will, uh, we'll be camping. Me and the troop will be camping, uh, down at a lake in the lower part of the county and, uh, setting up our radio gear and proceeding to, uh, see if we can't make some contacts all over the place because, well, that's what you do on Jamboree on the air. Now, of course, we'll also take handhelds and everything else. Uh, the boys can play with it. We'll generally just make it a radio weekend. And uh, it should be a lot of fun. So if you happen to be an amateur radio operator, or if you happen to uh, drive past a, a park or a church or something like that with a, with a bunch of people out in front and with, the, uh, with antennas all over the place, that's how you can spot them. <laughs> uh, they will be on... Uh, they will be on the air, hopefully, and uh, making contacts, well, all over the world, as a matter of fact, and because uh, that's what we do on Jamboree on the Air. Anyhow, it is this weekend, and uh, if you'd like to uh, get involved, uh, you know, tune around on the dials and uh, see if you can't find some scouts and uh, help them get enthused about amateur radio and, uh, you know, help them learn. That's the big thing. It's like I've always always said when you stop learning, well, what's the point? And uh, that's kind of the reason that I do what I do. And uh, we'll keep doing it, and well, until something changes. But for right now, yep, it's Jamboree on the air time, and uh, we're looking forward to it. Of course, right after Jamboree on the air, when we get back from that camping trip, i got to go away for a week for training, but uh, <laughs> there you go. That's the, uh, that's the fun of being an adult with the job. <laughs> Anyhow, Jamboree on the air this weekend. I also ran across another article, and this was uh, out of The Art of Manliness. Seven Mistakes New Wet Shavers Make. And uh, I don't know when this one was put out. Uh, October 12th, 2015. So it is just recent. And uh, I took a look at it and nodded my head a few times. First one, mistake number one. Poor prep. Uh, yeah. You know, um, one of the things that I do is, uh, is I will soak my brush and uh, jump in the shower. And that shower in that moist environment and everything else will, in fact, uh, you know, loosen things up and soften the, the you know, soften, soften the stubble up. I think I read somewhere that it's like stubble is 60% or something like that. Uh, easier to cut if you do that than if you don't, which uh, does make a difference because I have from time to time attempted because I was in a hurry to just throw on some blather, let it sit there for a minute and then shave. <laughs> Bad idea. <laughs> so poor prep. Um, it's also a, you know, wash your face, you know, get all the, the residual stuff off of it. Okay, mistake number two, and I can relate to this one a lot, lousy lather. 
Let me read this one. That pressurized can of shaving foam from the discount store might seem the way to go for someone learning how to wet shave. But it may be the worst decision you could make. Sure, it's cheap and convenient, and some people can use them without any problems, but there are some trade-offs. The can's propellant will tend to dry out the skin, so manufacturers have to add artificial lubricants to make up for it. Then, even more uh, ingredients that have nothing to do with shaving are added, like stabilizers and preservatives. Remember, your skin is the largest organ of your body, so every additional unneeded ingredient is one more chance for some kind of allergic reaction. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, in addition to that, if you, uh, if you lather with a brush, and if you make, if you make your lather, well, too thick, like a thick paste, it's not going to perform well. There's not enough moisture in it to, to let it do what it wants to do, or what it needs to do. On the other hand, if you make it too thin and runny, it's not going to work very well either. There is a balance. There, that's part of the learning curve. So I will agree, making lousy lather, whether it's goo in a can or whether it's made with a brush, um, yeah. Okay. Next one, ignoring grain. Yes, your beard has a grain to it. All hair does. And you need to know what that is. Some people, like myself, can for a final pass, go against the grain without any issues. Other people get terribly irritated by doing the same thing. Okay, this one is good. Number four, too much pressure. <laughs> yeah, um, on some razors, in some combinations, uh, any pressure at all will be dangerous, and too much pressure will be disastrous. Uh, I've got a little Mercure that right now has a, a carbon steel double-edged blade in it that if you put any pressure on it at all, it will snag you. But if you don't put any pressure on it, it gives a very, very nice shave. Okay, next one. Incorrect blade angle. Yeah. Um, especially if you're starting out. Get one razor and learn the angle for that razor. And learn it well before you start venturing off into getting a bunch of different razors. Because different razors sometimes have different angles. Now, some of the same brands have you know a similar angle. Uh, but there can be differences, especially if you do things like swap between double-edged and single-edged razors. Well, because the angle's completely different. Um, so something to keep in mind. It can get you in trouble if you don't know what you're looking for. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't try, but it does mean that you should be aware that there are differences and take that into account. Okay, the next one. Shaving over unlubricated skin. Yes, I have seen. <laughs> this is... Okay, so I am a scout leader, and I enjoy scouting. And from time to time, like summer camps and things like that, I get the opportunity to see young men trying to shave. And sometimes it is just laugh-worthy. <laughs> but they do their best. Okay, so one of the things that I have noticed, and one of the things that I try to tell them, is that whether you're using goo in a can or lather from a brush, you should be applying lather before you take another stroke or pass over an area that you've already done. You need to lubricate the skin, and the lubrication mechanism that you have is called soap. And uh, if you don't do that, you are going to get irritation and razor burn like nobody's business, especially if you have a razor that is, well, let's just say unforgiving to a certain extent. Uh, like a double-edged or single-edged razor. Now, the modern cartridge razors, they're a little bit yeah, more forgiving. You can get by with, you know, stroking a few times over the same area with one of those things. But, you know, you do better if you had some lubrication there. Okay, number seven, repeating strokes. This is kind of like uh, shaving over unlubricated skin, but, you know, going over the same spot again and again and again in the same direction, yeah, that's, hey, you don't want to do that. If you're going to go over the same spot, go over it in a different direction because it may be a grain issue. Now, if you want to find that out, take a stroke, take your hand and run it the same way, and you should feel smoothness. It's only if you go in side to side, like say you stroke down and you feel down and things feel smooth. 
and then you stroke sideways with your fingers, and you go, wait a minute, there's something there. You go the other direction, and there may not be. If you go up, you may see something as well. And what you're feeling there is the grain of your beard. And so, you know, stroking in the same direction over and over again probably isn't going to get it. So there you go, seven mistakes, and I'll link to it, but seven mistakes that, well, new wet shavers commonly make. And uh, that's okay. I've made them before, too. It's not that big a deal. You'll get over it. (laughs) Well, it is a foggy morning this morning. Uh, Apparently, all the moisture in the ground and everything has... uh, (laughs) Either that or else the uh, the moisture in the air has decided to uh, come down to earth level. And uh, one of the two things. Don't know if it's uh, cloud-born or ground-born, but uh, it's foggy out here. Some places are worse than others, but that's okay. We can uh, we can safely navigate this uh, this stuff. Anyhow, let's talk about the shave of the day. Okay, so uh, yesterday, being Sunday, uh, I got a little slack. I, I had uh, done some stuff on Saturday, and uh, my legs were just absolutely killing me. Uh, put on a well, just did some work, and uh, it was it was one of those things where standing up hurt, sitting down hurt, moving hurt, <laughs> just hurt. So uh, I decided that uh, one of the things that I was going to just not do, just because I was well in a little bit of distress, was uh, was shave. So I didn't. So this morning um, I uh, woke up. And I've been enjoying my Taylor of Old Bond Street Eaton College. I, I really, really enjoy the smell of that stuff, and uh, lather that up with the old uh, with the old uh, Samog Boar Brush 1305, and uh, went to town. Of course, I had to do it with cool water because my uh, my son, in his infinite wisdom, <clears throat> used all of the hot water, which made for an interesting shower. Uh, but we still got it done anyhow. Thanks. Uh, anyhow, the uh, the soap lathered up quite nicely with uh, with a touch of cool water, and uh, we proceeded to shave. Now, I, I was a little concerned because I I was thinking, you know, there might be a little bit of dragging, a little bit of pulling, and and just make it uncomfortable. And so I looked around and selected my little Mercur Bakelite razor with the uh, with a feather blade in it. Now, a feather blade's got some shaves on it, but uh, it wasn't a fresh feather blade. It was an older one, and it did the job just fine. In fact, uh, I actually only did two passes in a in a touch up, and uh, got a very very nice shave. Very underrated razor that one is. Um, I've always, always had good shaves with it. Anyhow, then I came down and made some coffee and uh, proceeded to uh, look around at my, <laughs> and my wife hates this, I have a bunch of shaving gear sitting on the kitchen table. Uh, and it's kind of taken over, I guess. I, I need to clean it up. But I don't really have much space to put it in, and so, uh, you know, it's one of those things. Anyhow, I uh, I, I reached over and uh, and grabbed a bottle of uh, of spicy, an old vintage Avon bottle, an old Model T or Model A, one of those things, an old vintage car, and it's filled with Avon spicy aftershave, and uh, proceeded to uh, to throw that on, and uh, got traffic all over the place. I'll tell you what, the traffic and fog, yeah, don't go together. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> proceeded to throw the spicy on, and uh, everything is good to go for the day. Looking forward to it. It's a Monday. Got scouts tonight. Should be interesting. Uh, get to tell them that I won't be here next Monday night and uh, see if we can't arrange something and uh, get all that taken care of. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, I ought to be able to take one night off, I would think. Go to training and uh, you know, carry on. But we'll see how it goes. Anyhow, that was the shave of the day. Well, I found out the other day that, lo and behold, my uh, my company is sending me to uh, uh, down to a training class, and I will be out of town for a week. 
So quite honestly, I don't know at this point uh, if I'm going to be able to uh, to do a podcast. I'm going to try, but uh, it may be, well, just a tad short. So we'll see what happens. But uh, going to be going down to uh, uh, to a training class, and uh, like I said, it uh be about a week. Bottom line is, we'll do our best, but uh, no guarantees. So <laughs> stay prepared, and I'll... Uh, I'll let you know. All right. So once again, just, well, because apparently it hasn't done it enough, it rained again last night. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I like rain in general, but uh, here in the last uh, couple weeks, um, I'm thinking no moss. <laughs> <sighs> Anyhow, it was a it was gentle rain, but it's just the just the concept of it really. Um after a while it just kinda just okay, I get it. You know, you want to drown me. It's it's all right. <sighs> Anyhow, let's talk about the shave of the day. So the shave of the day I did something interesting. So yesterday I used my little Mercure bake light. Um and in fact the blade that was in it was an old uh, Gillette silver blue. I took that blade out and proceeded to try something, well, a little different. I proceeded to try a Treat Classic carbon steel blade. Now, I enjoy carbon steel blades in my single-edged razor, and uh, I use PAL carbon steel blades, and really find that I get excellent shaves with them. I mean, just superb shaves with them. And uh, so it was kind of interesting that I went with the... uh, with the carbon steel or tried the carbon steel, I had not tried one before um, in my Mercure. Now, the other nice thing about Mercure, uh, the Bakelite, is the fact that it's made out of plastic. Bakelite, but plastic nonetheless. And other than the brass stud that you screw the handle into, there's no metal which means that there shouldn't be any damaging issues if there are any problems with rust on the carbon steel blade. So we'll try it. It looks like it's coated, but uh, we'll give it a shot. And I didn't dry it off or anything, so we'll give that a try just to see, well, what happens. Um, Again, first go around with carbon steel blades. Now, the shave that I got with these things was fantastic. It it really, really was. However, they, well, first off, they're sharp. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like having a feather blade in the thing. Um, and it was probably about as smooth. Uh, you know, it. I didn't have any real issues there. The one thing that I noticed is that uh, I had a couple of small bumps on my face. And uh, the carbon steel blade just really did a... Uh, uh, well, a wonderful job of of slicing. <laughs> yeah, I got a couple of very very small nicks, um, but at the same time, uh, no pressure, good uh, good shave. Um, use the Eaton College again, you know the the Taylor Vol Bond Street Eaton College, and uh, lathered it up with my little Vulfix travel brush. <laughs> ah, it's the morning. I can't say these things. <laughs> tongue just doesn't want to go that way anyhow it was a uh, it was a great shave now to uh to finish it all off i uh, i've been trying some some vintage uh, aftershaves that, that joel sent me and the one that i tried today was uh aqua velva now this is my second go around with the aqua velva classic aqua velva not uh not the old stuff so i'll have to see if i can get if, if they make a new uh new edition of aqua velva so i can try to see what the difference is but the first time I tried it, it was like, okay, this is uh, predominantly alcohol and uh, not much smell. And Well, this go around, and I'm thinking because I'm getting a little bit deeper in a bottle, shaking it up a little bit more, there's a little bit more, uh, you know, smell, if you will, uh, fluids, oils, whatever. Um, so it's got a little bit more of a uh, of a scent to it, which is very, very pleasant. Um it's a uh, it's a clean scent. It's a and and I'm I'm sorry I'm so bad with scents, but uh, but but I do enjoy it. Uh, so we'll just leave it there. So all in all, I'm I'm really 
I'm happy and I'm intrigued with the uh, with the treat classics in carbon steel. Again, I haven't uh, uh, haven't used a carbon steel blade per se. I believe the majority of the ones that I've used have been stainless, and so it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see just uh, how the treats well treat me. Well, I have noticed something here of late. Um, people, especially in the business world, just really don't like to be questioned. Uh, it's it's an interesting phenomena, and it's almost as if they don't have the ability to argue their case. Now, I will admit, I enjoy, and and, and I will say arguing, but what I really mean is debating. Uh, I will admit debating or arguing my case with anyone. And if they can prove a different side of things, I'm cool with that. But they're going to have to prove it because I have a tendency to be, well, just a little bit strong in my opinions. And I think that's okay. But the thing is, is that if someone cannot argue their, uh, their way out of a paper bag, it becomes exceedingly difficult for them to prop up a position that they have taken. And so what ends up happening is when you challenge those positions, when you ask, okay, have you ever considered this? Or why are you taking this stance when you have this fact over here? They become, well, uptight and not, I mean, they're not aggressive, but they become mad that you brought it up. And I'm sorry, but we ought to be able to, as adult human beings, have a discussion, a debate over whether someone's facts are in fact valid from time to time, especially when you're talking about the expenditures of rather large amounts of time and money to either uh, to, to try to uh, do something. It's it's amazing that when you bring things up, the they're they're seen as challenging and mean and mad and it's just really all I did was throw on the table a fact that it appears you have not considered. You know, if you have in fact considered it, say so and say this is yes we considered it and we found that it didn't have any validity. Fair enough, but don't sit there and say this is the way it is just because. And when someone says, well, why? And you say, just because. I'm sorry, we should not be in an authoritarian world. We have enough of that in uh, in, in other avenues in our lives and, uh, you know, in the, in the business realm, uh, especially amongst colleagues. I understand taking orders from a boss, that's what you're paid to do. But when you're when you're having these discussions with, well, colleagues, you should at least have the capability and uh and even desire to have an open discussion of throwing facts on the table this way or that way and at least explore but it seems like we have gotten to the point where we don't even do that. Now, the other interesting thing that that brings to mind is that we have sort of changed words around a bit because what I'm talking about is rhetoric. And rhetoric, in the classic sense, is, is not necessarily your stance on something, but it is, in fact, your ability to convincingly argue your case. And we have completely lost the idea that that's what rhetoric is, and we have, in fact, in a lot of cases, described rhetoric as being, well, bad. You know, th this, this politician has the wrong rhetoric, or rhetoric that is not politically correct. Well, what they're talking about in that situation is an idea not necessarily his, his ability or her ability to make a case. It's really interesting. We have given rhetoric or the ability to make an argument 
to argue a case, a, a very, well, foreign idea. It seems like the only way anymore that anybody is able to argue a case is if you happen to be a lawyer in court. But other than that, um, you will not argue the case. You will accept the status quo. You will accept the, the thinking of the majority. Well, there's a problem with that. If you accept the thinking of the majority, then we never progress. We sit here and stagnate with exactly what we have. You ever thought about that? It's the, it's the people who think, as it were, outside the box that allow the people that are in the box to either have a bigger box or to go somewhere else completely. And if you continually pound on people to say you will accept the normal way, quote-unquote, of thinking about things, what you end up doing is killing the ability to think outside the box. And the funny thing is, is at the same time, we all kind of give lip service to, well, think outside the box. But in fact, by some people's reactions, that's exactly what we don't want people to do. It really is an interesting situation from a societal level. It's like we, we want to talk about something, but we don't want to talk about facts. We want to talk about feelings and emotions and, well, it's not fair. Well, let's talk about facts. You know, if you, if you throw the facts on the table, if you can find a, a fact that allows you to make an argument and you can argue appropriately, great. Otherwise, why don't we just admit that, yeah, it's just a, a, a feeling or or something. I don't know. It just really drives me insane because, like I said, I don't mind, and in fact, I enjoy arguing a case. I enjoy saying, look, this is how I feel, this is why I feel, and if you would like to try to convince me to feel something different, feel free, let's have that discussion. And that may be one of the reasons why I don't try to ram things down people's throats. Because to me, it's everything is the way I understand it until I am proven wrong or something else is proven to be the reality of the situation. And I am open to that discussion and I am, I'm open to that change. But in talking to people, I've kind of come to the understanding that, well, some people aren't necessarily open to uh, having a change of heart, a change of opinion, or a change of their attitudes. <sighs> oh, well. Meanwhile, those of us that uh, that like to argue cases are seen as mean and, you know, aggressive and, well, okay, maybe. I just want you to convince me of something. <sighs> All right. Well, we'll carry on. And uh, personally, I enjoy rhetoric. And I enjoy being able to argue a case to make my point. Well, that concludes this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed making it. If you have some suggestions or would like a topic covered, drop me an email at brushandsoapandblade at gmail.com or give me a call at 864-372-6234 or contact us on Twitter at Brush and Blade. You can also visit us at our blog, brushandsoapandblade.wordpress.com. As always, we're available on iTunes and Stitcher. <laughs>